This morning we're going to continue our very short series on the um, topic of holiness. And uh, in order to open the subject, I'd like to uh, read for you a, a short passage uh, from the book of John, chapter 12. Our text is verses 25 through um, verse 26, but we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 20. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, I hope you saw in those last couple of verses, verses 25 and 26, that the Lord is here telling us the blessings of being holy, that we must die like a grain of wheat. We must die, as it were, so that we might bear much fruit. Jesus says, if you love your life in this world, you will lose it. In other words, if you live for yourself, if you live for your own glory, if you pursue the things that the people of the world pursue, uh, your own, again, glory, your own status, your own wealth, then you're going to lose your life. But if you hate your life, not, you know, hate yourself personally, but if you hate that kind of life in this world where you pursue your own things in this life, if you will die to yourself, if you will seek after the things above, then you will keep it to life eternal. In other words, here is one blessing for being holy, and that is you will see heaven. If you follow Jesus Christ, you will be where he is. If you will serve him, the Father will honor you. These are all just different ways of saying if you will be holy then you will be granted certain blessings, certain privileges. And that's what we want to look at this morning. Why should you want to be holy? And what we're going to see is, again, because of the many blessings that come from holiness. Now, last week, as we opened this short series on holiness, I'm attending really only three sermons, we saw what holiness is. Now, the basic meaning behind holiness is to be set apart it refers to separation, being separated from one thing to another. And as we know, the word particularly means to be set apart from common use to God's use. I mean, if we set something apart to ourselves, that doesn't make it holy. But when God sets it apart to himself, that's what makes it holy. Now, when the word is applied to God, it refers to his being separated from sin. It refers to his absolute love, or I should say, yes, his love of everything that is good, everything that is right, everything that's proper, and his absolute hatred of everything that is contrary to that, everything bad, everything wrong, everything that is improper. When the word is applied to things, it means those things are set apart to him exclusively for his use such as what we saw with the holy incense and the anointing oil. Uh, the priests that were set apart to minister to him in his tabernacle, in his temple. The land of Palestine that belonged to him. Uh, the city of Jerusalem where he put his name. And of course the holy temple that was built there in which he would dwell. It belonged to him. And when it is applied to people, it means those people are set apart to him set apart from the world to God, to be his possession, to live exclusively, as it were, for his use, to be at his disposal, to use as he wills. And it means, of course, that they too 
are to be like God. They are to be holy. They are to set themselves apart from sin in order to do what is right, to do what is good, to do what is proper. Again, I told you I was going to remind you of this, what we read last week in the first letter Peter wrote. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Do not be conformed to those former lusts, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now when God called you by His Word, when He called you by the Gospel, and when He empowered that call by His Holy Spirit, when He issued that in internal call, and you responded in faith, you trusted Jesus Christ, you turned from your sins, God set you apart to, to Himself. Basically, He made you holy, uh, positionally holy. You became His, and He also began the process of making you practically holy or morally pure. Uh, you do need to see, I need to see, we need to realize that this is the purpose behind God's choosing you. This is why He sent His Son into the world. He didn't send Him just to save you from hell, but we are very thankful that He did that. But He also sent Jesus into the world to save you from the power of sin, uh, to save you from evil, uh, to make you like Him. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. You see, this was His purpose in choosing us, not just to save us, but that we would be holy that we would be blameless. And that doesn't mean just in Christ. That also means practically in the way that we live. Now, I would again remind you, as we all know very well, as hard as we try, we're not going to be able to be perfect in this world. But by God's grace, we can be a lot better than we are. And the Lord intends that we pursue that. So basically, the first point is that God has set you apart to Himself, for Himself, that He might use you to do His work in this world. And He has given you His Holy Spirit to help you do this. But in order to do this, you must become like Him. You must be holy, the Lord says, because He is holy. Now again, before we look at the last point, which is you know, how can we be holy? And certainly, you know, we need to know that. We need to know what that is. We need to know how to pursue those kinds of things. I thought we should briefly consider why you should want to be holy. You know, the question is often asked today when somebody's asked to do something. Well, what's in it for me? <laughs> you know, what do I get out of it? And, and that may be a crass way of putting this because we know as believers that we really don't need external motivation, at least in one sense. I mean, we don't need God to dangle a carrot in front of our noses to get us to go a particular way because God has already given us His Holy Spirit. He's already changed our hearts. He's already given us a great love for, for Him and for His Son and for His kingdom and for the right way to live, for His law, for His commandments. But we do have to admit it's also true that God has given us incentives. He has given to you promises, uh, great promises, precious promises, to help you move forward that are worth everything that God calls you to give in order to gain them. And Jesus illustrates that very well in, in some of the parables in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and 46. I mean, think about what he says here. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has 
and buys that field so that he can possess the treasure in the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see, at least in this case, Jesus says, those who see the value of the kingdom of heaven are willing to part with everything they have, everything they possess, everything they would ever possess in order to have it. Jesus did say on one occasion, unless you're willing to part with all your possessions, even with your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Now, what does he mean by that? Everybody has to sell their, everything they have and, and give it away? Not necessarily, but... We do need to be willing to give it all if Jesus should call us to give it all. Sometimes he does, but obviously not in every case. Otherwise, we'd all be on the streets, wouldn't we? The Lord gives to us certain things to be a blessing to us. But the kingdom of heaven is much more precious and much more desirable for those who see its value. But the kingdom of heaven comprises many things. What is it that he's talking about here? Well, he's talking about, of course, that kingdom that we're going to inherit someday, but it also talks about all the other blessings that flow from that kingdom. What are those blessings? What is it that God actually promises you? If you will take Jesus at his word, if you will trust him, if you will turn from your sins, and if you will live this life of holiness that he calls you to live. What exactly is the Lord promising? Well, let's just look at maybe three main categories of these things that we'll call security, privilege, and reward. Now, the first thing that the Lord promises to give you is security, both in this life and in the world that is to come. And I would venture to say that security is something that is at the top of our list of things that, that we desire, things that we would like to have. I think we would all like to know that we're going to make it through this world, that we're going to make it safely through this life. We all want to know that at the end of our lives that we're not going to die and end up in hell, but that we're going to end up in heaven, and that that heaven is going to continue forever, that God's not going to just get tired of us and drop us off the edge, as it were, at some point in time. Well, how can you be sure that you can have all these things? There's really only one way that God says, and that is through holiness, because God has promised to give these things only to those who are holy. And again, I would remind you, holy by his definition, not holy by man's definition or by any other supposed deity but only the definition God gives us, the true and only God. Now, Jesus says, if you will live a life set apart, if you will put his kingdom first, you can be sure that he will take care of you. God says he will give you everything you need as you're passing through this world to make it to the end. He will give you food. He will give you clothing. He will give you protection. Now, I know there's a lot of things people look to in order to provide those things for them, but God is the only one who ultimately can. I mean, having a good job is not going to give you security. You can lose any job that you have. I I think you know that's true. Having lots of money isn't the answer because not only can a great deal of wealth be a snare to you, as we've already seen, covetousness is, is idolatry, but it can easily be taken away from you And what about protection? What are you going to do in that department? Well, being able to defend yourself, is that enough? Being an expert in martial arts, packing, as it were, a pistol, is is that going to ensure your safety and your security? I think sometimes we like to think that it does. But you do need to remember there's always somebody stronger. There's always somebody that can get the jump on you. If you trust those things, they will not secure you. Ultimate security only comes from God. It comes from seeking him and being the kind of person he calls you to be. I mean, consider what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 through 33. Again, regarding wealth, putting your trust in wealth, putting your trust in any other thing to provide for your needs, for your security. He says this, no one can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory not even Solomon, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father's Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So how do you get these particular things? How do you get food? How do you get clothing? Which is really all you need to exist. And how do you get protection? How do you extend your life? Well, it comes only by seeking the kingdom of heaven. Seeking first His kingdom, not second, not third, not at the very end of your list, and not just on the Lord's day, but putting him first, seeking the kingdom first and his righteousness. If you do this, he will provide for you. He will also protect you. I I do want you to, to notice, I'm sure you have, as you read the book of Psalms, how many times those who wrote the Psalms were in danger, how many times they cried out to the Lord, how many times they saw his deliverance because they knew He was the only one who ultimately could secure their lives in this world. Let me give you one example from Psalm 91, verses 1 through 9, perhaps one of the clearest passages of Scripture that talks about what God will do for those who seek security in Him. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Now, is is the psalmist saying here that if you trust God, if you make him his refuge, you're never going to die? No, that's not what he's saying because all men die. All men return to the dust. But what he means is that even then, God will be your refuge. Even then, he will take you to himself. Even then, he will care for you as we're going to see now. But if you put the kingdom first, you put it first in your life, you put Christ first, you seek to be holy, God will take care of you. You want security? That's how you get it. He's the one who's in control. It's not fate. It's not chance. It's God, and He can make things work for you as well as work against you. You need to trust Him and seek to be holy. Now again, what about that life that's coming? Well, again, the Lord says He's going to take care of that too. If the Lord has set you apart for Himself, He will never lose you. And the reason why He he won't lose you is because having saved you by the work of His Son, He intends to give you to His Son, which means He's not going to let even one of us fall away. 
Listen to what Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I do want you to notice that this is referring to Jesus' sheep, that he knows and who know him. And they are characterized by following him. And what that means is they're seeking to be holy, right? They're pursuing holiness. Those are the ones he gives eternal life to. These are the ones who will never perish. These are the ones who cannot be taken out of his hand because the Father has given them to him. They're his possession forever. Paul basically says the same thing in Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The Lord, if you pursue holiness, will not only secure you in this world, but he will also secure you in the world which is to come. And as to the fact that he will not only bring you into heaven, but will keep you there forever, Paul writes this regarding Jesus' return. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 17, and again, I want you to notice that when he returns, there are going to be saints who have died, but their souls are going to be with the Lord in heaven, and he's going to bring with him those who have died. But I want you to notice the final words of this passage. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. I know that we know that that's true, but I just wanted you to see that again from Scripture. That if you will live a life set apart for the Lord, if you will seek to be holy as He is holy, He's not only going to take care of you here, but He will take care of you forever. Holiness is the path to security, and let me just remind you, it is the only path. So that is basically the first blessing, the first um, benefit. What's in it for me? If I'm going to live a holy life, what do I get out of it? Well, you get security in this life, and you know that you're going to be in heaven. Really, you can only know that if you're living a holy life, even if you possess it. If you fall into sin, you really can't be sure that it's yours because grieving and quenching the Spirit of God takes away a measure of that assurance. And you no longer are convinced that that is the case. But if you live a holy life, it strengthens your assurance that those things belong to you. Now, what is the second thing that he promises to give? Well, he promises to give you certain privileges. Now, the first privilege is that of adoption. Becoming a part of the most blessed family in heaven or on earth, Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 4, 4 through 6. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Have you ever wished that you were born into a different family, into another family than the one in which you were born? Have you ever wished that maybe you had bo been born into the family of a wealthy celebrity? I, I think uh, perhaps all of us have at one time or another, but I do want you to think about something. Think about the privileges that you have now in being in the family of God, okay? If you had been born into the family of a wealthy celebrity, what likely would have happened to you? What happened to the rich young ruler when he came to Jesus? What happened to the rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? What did Jesus say regarding the difficulty of entering into the kingdom of heaven? If you are rich and affluent, Matthew 19, 24, 
it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Is it really a blessing to be rich? You know, the Bible says it isn't. Even though there are so many uh, so-called prophets today telling you that God wants you to be healthy, He wants you to be wealthy, God says that wealth can destroy you. God only gives it to those who can actually handle it and are going to use it for His glory. To the rest of it, it's, the rest of us, it's just a stumbling block. You don't want that. What you should glory in instead is that you were born into the family of God. Uh, instead of wishing that you had been born into maybe a family like that, be thankful that by His grace you were born into a Christian household where you actually got to hear the gospel. And now you're safe, you're saved, and you're on your way to heaven. It's far better to be in that family and through that, let's say, the Christian family into the family of God than it is to be in the family of the wealthiest and most affluent, even though you get to play with all the world's toys. This is much more important, even though you have to deal with difficulties, like the psalmist tells us in Psalm 73, which we won't look at at this point, but he looked at how the, the wicked were prospering, and he looked at how difficult it was for him, and he says, what good is this? Well, he didn't realize just how good it was until he went into the household of God, into the temple, and he saw the end of those people, how they were cast down in a moment, how they were utterly destroyed because they were the wicked. God held them accountable for their sins. But the righteous inherit the kingdom of heaven. In this family, you're going to be blessed forever. So that is a privilege, being in the household of God and being heirs of the kingdom of heaven, as we've already seen. But now a second privilege is being in the family of God, you actually get to become like Jesus Christ. You get to be transformed into His image. We read in 2 Peter, verses, um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. And note this, for by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. I want you to notice those words, you have become partakers of the divine nature. What does he mean by that? Does that mean that you are going to become God? Or be, you know, I mean, the, the worldwide church of God believes that there's not a trinity, but everybody who trusts in God actually enters into the Godhead. That's not what he means. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, on a number of occasions, said what this means is that you do become little gods and now you can speak into existence things that don't exist like God does. No, that's not what he means. What is this divine nature he's referring to? It is holiness. It is the image of Christ. It's a moral image. It's not, you know, you don't gain his, his, his essence or his power and become God, but you become like him. You become like Him in that you love what is good and right. And that is a privilege to become like Him. Uh, rather than continuing to bear the image of the God of this world, which is the one you, you had when you came into this world, and being like the people of the world who are in essence, I know this may sound shocking, but it's true. It's what the Bible says. Are like Satan. That's what an unconverted person is like. They're like Satan, which is why they're called evil, the children of this world who walk according to the prince of the power of the air. Well, you don't have to bear that image anymore. You don't have to be like that. Jesus is making you like himself. You now bear his image. And that's very important because of the third privilege the Lord has given to you. You're not going to be able to fulfill this privilege unless you actually bear his image. And that is the greatest privilege that you get to be the heralds of His message of reconciliation. You get to be the messengers of the gospel. Remember Jesus said to His disciples, and through them He says to you this morning in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How are you going to be able to do this at all unless you are made like Jesus Christ? How are you going to appear as somebody who brings good news if you're like the people of the world and you're going through the same struggles and difficulties and you have the same attitudes and you desire the same things? It's just going to appear as hypocrisy. But if you are like Jesus Christ, if you have that joy, if you have that happiness, knowing you're secure, if you have that peace, that'll make a difference. You know, the messenger makes a big difference in the message, and we need to make sure that we are like Jesus in order to bring Jesus to others. But that is the privilege, you see, that the Lord gives to us as we pursue holiness, is that you and I will become like Jesus Christ. Sometimes we think it's, it's merely a a duty to bring the gospel to others. Sometimes, sadly, we think it's a burden to do that. But it is a privilege, and let me show you why. Which end would you rather be on? Would you rather be the one in darkness, the one who's on his way to hell that needs to hear the message? Or would you rather be the one who has embraced it, the one who loves Jesus Christ, the one who knows his eternity is secure, the one whose heart is full of joy, bringing that message to other people? Which is a privilege to you? You see, it is a great honor. It's a great blessing. It's a great privilege to be those who are the messengers, to be his children, to bear his likeness, and to herald this message. But these privileges are only reserved for those who are holy. Now, the last thing he promises is reward. You see, if, if you will live this life set apart that he calls you to live, if you will serve him in this life, if you will faithfully bear witness of his gospel, not only through your words, but through the power of a changed life, God is going to give you a reward. You know, this reward is very important because this is the only thing that you and I get to keep from everything that we possess in this world. Because remember, there's a time coming when we've got to give it all up. You realize that everything that the unbeliever, you know, again, we look at, we look at the people of this world and we say, oh, isn't it great so-and-so has all this wealth? Isn't it great so-and-so has all this talent? Isn't it great they've made all these movies, they've sung all these songs, they've made all these touchdowns and sunk all these baskets and we think about all the things, you know, the people of the world do. But you realize that everything that they have, everything, is one day going to be gone they're going to have to give it up when they die. And you realize as well that even though their name may live on, I mean, we still remember certain individuals in history, both for good or bad, you know, who have made a great name for themselves. Do you realize there's a day coming when their name is going to be totally forgotten? Uh, when we're no longer going to think about Caesar or Hitler or anybody we might consider to have been a great man who did great things, Kennedy and all the, all the names you can think of, okay? All those things are going to be forgotten and not even come to anyone's mind again when the world is done. Even worse, the things that the people of this world have and the things that the people of this world have done and all the glory they have received for themselves is even going to speak out against them on the day of judgment. That's what the Bible says. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 16, verses 27, or 26 and 27, For what will it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. You see, all that is worse than nothing, worse than worthless. It's actually going to speak out against those who possess them on the day of judgment. But here's the blessing of holiness. The, true, the same thing isn't true for you because everything that God has given to you that you set apart for Him, and again, your life, your talents, your resources, everything is to be set apart for His glory. Everything you actually give to God, everything you do for God is, is going to be remembered. 
Everything you do because you love him, everything you do because you want to honor him, all of these things you will get to take out of this world, you will get to keep forever. This will be rewarded. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now Jesus here is warning us not to set our affection on the things of this world. They can be taken away from you. He doesn't mention it here, but I've already said, if you die, you've got to let all of it go, right? But store up treasures in heaven, which means it's possible to store treasures in heaven. And you do that by being holy. Only holiness leads to rewards that you get to keep forever. The things you hold on to in this life for yourself, you lose. You lose all of it. But everything you give to God, everything you give up for Him, everything you use for Him, everything you count as His, again, including time and all that you do, resources, talents, those are the things you will get to keep. So the question is, do you want to be secure? Do you want security here? Do you want to know that everything's going to work out well in the end? Do you want these privileges of adoption, of sonship, of being like him, of heralding his gospel? Do you want the only treasure, the only riches, the only wealth that you can keep forever? Now in one sense, if you're a believer, these things are already yours. But you do need to realize you can't increase them. Everybody doesn't get the same thing. How do you increase them? Through holiness by pursuing greater holiness. Again, Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 and 16, or through 16, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The more you seek the kingdom of heaven, the more the Lord's going to provide for you. The more you seek to be holy, the stronger your assurance is going to be that heaven belongs to you. The more you set your life apart, the more you are going to sense God's fatherly love. The more you bear his image, the more effective your witness is going to be. And since you're going to have greater witness and more effectiveness, the greater your reward is also going to be. So what's in it for you? Well, all these blessings, all these privileges, all these honors, this reward, these are all in it for you. God has given them to you as incentives to pursue holiness. And if he has opened your eyes by his grace, you know these are valuable and they're worth anything, like the treasure hidden in the field, like the pearl of great price. Now what can you expect if you're not holy? What can you expect if you're not a believer? Well, the Bible says you can expect only one thing and that is judgment for your sins because God is holy and he cannot overlook one sin, not even one sin. We have thousands of sins. We have millions of sins. He can't overlook those things. That's why he sent his son into the world is because he's just. That's why Jesus died on the cross, because God can't simply wink at sin. It has to be punished if he is going to forgive. So, what can you do? Well, all you can do is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because heaven is only for those who are holy. If you want to go to heaven, you must be holy. And if you would be holy, what you must do is turn from your sins. You must trust Jesus. Trust the sacrifice that he made, his death on the cross. Trust the life that he lived, the obedience that you need to get into heaven. Let Jesus be your only trust. Trust him to save you. And then seek by his grace to live 
this kind of life we've been talking about, a holy life. And then these blessings will be yours. Well, I hope we're all encouraged this morning to pursue holiness. Now, next week, we're going to look at how we are to do that. But this morning, let's just, again, let these things be so many motivations to us to pursue it. Let's bow in a few moments of prayer and ask for the Lord's grace to do that.